God said, let there be light. And there was light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the light shone in the darkness. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And the light, light shall, shall not, not be quenched. quenched. Let us pray. Dear God, as we come together, knowing that we're not alone, we're never alone. You who created us is here to sustain us. And we would ask that this morning, our time together will enable us to see how we might be the light that can help this world find peace and justice and not continue to live in such fear. We're grateful for our church and ask that as we come together today, we might be enlightened to see how we can be a light, even though it's hard to see that we can be a light like Jesus. Yet there have been individuals who have stood out in our culture and been that light. Let us follow them and follow the teachings of Jesus that this world might be a better place, more like heaven on earth. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. May the peace of Christ be with you. The words of your prophet Isaiah strike like a double-edged sword this morning, a piercing light into our darkened lives. Our rebellion is exposed. Day after day, week after week, Sunday after Sunday, we claim to seek after God. Yet, we continue to serve our own interests and in so doing, blindly oppress our neighbors, both near and distant. We confess that we use our acts of piety to make ourselves feel good about ourselves, to assure ourselves that we are Christians, to confidently claim that we are different from the rest of the world. But as Isaiah says, we use our piety, our fasts, our singing, our preaching, our prayers, to turn our heads upwards to the heights of heaven while we crush the people around us under our feet. We walk blindly, unaware of our destruction. As you say in Isaiah, the holiness you desire, God of love, God of peace, happens as we contemplate the ways that the lives we enjoy may be wrapped up in the hidden oppressions and secret violences. You call us to loose the bonds of injustice, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, to share our bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into our houses, and when we see the naked, to cover them and not to hide ourselves from the needy. We pray that in your mercy, O oh God, you will go before us, preparing our eyes and ears to contemplate our lives in every season so that we may discover the victims hidden from us and repent of our sins. Then, O oh Lord, as your prophet declares, we may begin to see how your light shall break forth from the midst like the dawn. And your healing hands will work through ours. We will be given the profound gift of serving in your realm, participating in your work of redemption, joining our lives to yours, and tasting the fruit of eternal life. Hold us in your grace, O oh God, that we may practice this kind of piety, this kind of worship that bears witness to the justice of your holy embrace with which you hold the whole world. And it's in Jesus' name we say this prayer. And now join me in the prayer Jesus taught us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is found in the 58th chapter of the book of Isaiah. 58th chapter of Isaiah. And we will be reading verses 1 through 12. And I've added some lead ends into some of the verses to indicate who is speaking because this is a dialogue between God, the prophet, and the people. God said to the prophet, shout out, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments, they delight to draw near to God. To which the people respond, Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, responds the Lord, you serve your own interest on this fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it not to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to... Share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then... You shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. It's been centuries, this search for the right way to commune with the divine and with each other. This morning, you may have noticed that the hymns don't follow a particular theme. Even the call to discipleship is all creatures of our God and King, which isn't, doesn't really sing like just as I am or those traditional altar call kind of songs. And the way that I selected the hymns this week was a bit different. Usually I will go through the hymnal and try to find songs that correlate with the themes of my sermon. This time I typed in my internet search engine, top 10 hymns of all time. And I found several uh, lists of the top 10 hymns. And then I went through those lists and I found the most common ones and I picked the ones that have been the favorites through the centuries. 
And so we let off with praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, written in 1665, ranked number sixth on the list. Then we went back even a few more years to that old song by St. Francis of Assisi, written in 1225, almost 800 years ago. All creatures of our God and King. I bet you can't guess which the most popular hymn was. If you want to cheat, you can look in your bulletins, and that's fine. It's almost our second national anthem. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That's right. 1779. The most recent song is Blessed Assurance, which I know that we've sung more or less recently, maybe a month ago, but that's the most current song I selected, written in 1873. And my reason for selecting these songs is to show that through the centuries, we have been trying to find the best songs to sing to God, the best ways to worship God. And worship has been reduced to singing these days. You know this because when somebody asks you, what is the worship like at your church? What they really mean is, what genre of music have you selected and what kind of songs do you sing? Worship doesn't need to be reduced to that. It should not be reduced to that. Worship should be everything that calls our attention to the divine and away from ourselves and to each other and the image of God that we see reflected there. But let's just stick with songs for a second. We've tried to find the perfect words, the perfect melodies sung in the right way. And the good news is we have cracked the code. We have found the songs that everyone has agreed are the best to sing. And so all I really need to do is, like picking songs on the jukebox, hit the same songs on repeat, and all of God's people in every church and sanctuary this Sunday morning are perfectly happy and content. Mm. If only it were that easy. If only it were that easy. This is not a settled matter. It seems like we cannot agree on what are the best songs to sing to God. When I started in the ministry in my last church more than 10 years ago, some of you say, well, that's, that's kind of a long time. Some of, you, some of you are like, oh, you whippersnapper. <laughs> For me, 10 years is like one third of my life. Um, <laughs> don't want to rub it in. But... When I started, first year as senior pastor, I was like, I'm going to crack this code. I'm going to find the formula for maybe not the church broadly speaking, but that church, so that when we come together, we will be singing the right songs and saying the right words and praying in the right way and preaching the right length of time, which does matter to more than a few folks. And so I created a survey. And the survey was basically every element in the bulletin, starting with introduction, call to worship, hymns, offering, sermon, you know, the components of a service. And I asked them to rate the importance of that part of the service on a scale of 1 to 10. And then below that, I put about three lines where somebody could write comments, suggestions, things that we ought to change, things that I ought to think about, and then the last section was just general comments. And I remember I got back 22 responses, this packet handed back. And I spent the next couple of weeks going through and trying to find the common themes. And I just sort of cut it right down the middle. Some people want more hymns. Some people want less hymns. I'll find them happy median. Some people wanted longer sermons. Probably not. But lots of people wanted shorter sermons, so I would find the, the right balance. Some people wanted to move communion to the end of the service. Some people wanted to keep it where it was. Some people wanted, well, you see how it would go. And so I came back after a few weeks with the perfect formula. And we went through it one Sunday, maybe two. And then the reviews started pouring in. People started handing me bulletins, annotated, with 
their suggestions and what was wrong with the new way. And so I would recalibrate. I remember pastoral relations committee meetings became dominated with this conversation. Sometimes it was somebody who heard something about some dissatisfaction with the service. Sometimes it was the person on that committee having problems with it. And this went on for, I think, half a year. And so finally, at one elders meeting, which we used to have in, before the service, one of the elders had a bulletin with his notes, and he tried to hand it to me at the beginning, and I said, I am tired of this garbage. I may have used a different word. Not the one you're thinking. And he said, it's not garbage. It's our worship. And he missed the point. I'm not against worship, I'm all for it. I was just tired of this struggle to find the right song to sing to God. So that same week, another elder came to the office with a bulletin with his notes and he said, here, you do this and everyone will be happy. And I looked at it, and it was the original bulletin we started with before all of the headache and the trouble. And so, that's what we did. And finally, we discovered the perfect worship, the right words, the right songs to sing to God. No. Let me say that different. We, fr we found the right worship, the right songs, the right words to speak, to sing to ourselves. Do you want to sing a song to God? Is that what we came here to do this morning? And I got to tell you, I think this is true in most of our considerations about what goes on in the sanctuaries all across of our, our nation, our country, our state, our city. We are trying to find the right songs that hit that sweet spot, that meet our sensibilities and our aesthetic tastes. And that's all very important. You need to find the format that is the most winsome to the most people. Art is important, songs are important, and how they are sung are important. But what underlies this whole discussion is mostly what sort of songs and words do we want to say to ourselves? And in this passage that we read, God is fairly upset and tells the prophet to say to the people, to announce it like a trumpet, to speak of their rebellion and the ways that they have sinned. And the people are very confused because in their minds they have been faithfully going through the cycles of ritual to try to call God back into their presence. The context is the Babylonian exile. And Instead of singing songs, what they're doing is they're fasting, which is another form of worship, time-tested, and maybe we should consider more of it, especially as we're coming into this season of Lent. But for them, it wasn't the songs, it was the fasts, and the kind of fasts, and the ways that they did the fasts, and why they came together to fast in the first place. And the people said, God, have you not seen the fasts? They say, why do we not fast, but you do not see? Why do we not humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Or I might reframe it for us. God, we have sung such lovely songs through the years. We have prayed such beautiful prayers. Our communion reflections been carefully thought through and the best we could offer 
And there was a time when our choir sang and sang as if God will answer when we get the songs right. Is that what God is waiting on? God answers, look, you serve your own interest on your fast day. You want to sing a song to God? Look, you fast only to quarrel and fight. Sound familiar? Strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. What is the song God wants us to sing? The fast God wants us to choose. To loose the bonds of injustice. To undo the thongs of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free. To break every yoke. Share your bread with the hungry. Bring the homeless into your homes. Clothe the naked. You've heard it said again and again. You want to sing a song to God. That is our worship. After all, we sing songs to God so that we might come to see God better, forgetting that all persons are born in the image of God. It makes perfect sense when you think about it. Whilst we are so introspective, thinking of the way the sounds hit our ears and the awkward way that person prayed or the way that sometimes uh, communion doesn't go exactly right and somebody forgets this or that. or We're all in our own heads. As soon as you look out and see your neighbor and their need, remembering that they are made in God's image. What worship is meant to do at its best, which is to call our attention outwards from ourselves and to the God of love and to those who God has made. When you see God and find them in the eyes of the poor or the oppressed, the first notes of that song that you are singing to God begin to go out from your soul. And everything else is just the trappings, the packaging, the bow we put on the top of this thing we call worship. You begin to care less about the songs that you're singing and more about those that you're singing with. And those that you're singing with may not be too keen on the order and the style, the standing, the sitting, the format but they know that this community is doing important work for the realm of God. And so we will stand and sing songs that we are at best indifferent to, so long as the people we are standing beside are meeting the needs of a world that is hungry and thirsty, or is in chains and bound up in all sorts of forms of slavery, whether it's to substance, to alcohol or drugs or literally in prison. When you are standing beside people in church like this, where you know that this is the plan making, the meeting where we dream about where to go next, who to liberate next in the name of God, well then, I'll even sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, however childish it may make me feel. I will sit through boring sermons. I will fall asleep during long prayers. And it will all be okay because our worship is the work that we do for those who need the love of God. If you offer your food to the hungry, verse 10, and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will con 
continually guide you and satisfy your needs in parched places. Make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Isn't that what we want church to be like? This place where our bones feel stronger when we leave and our souls feel full, quenched by the living water. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall rise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to live in. Even cracked and dirty streets such as we have here in Indianapolis. You want to build a church here in Northwood. This is the song that we sing. This is the fast God desires. And if we sing this sort of song to God, God will surely hear. And on that foundation, this church will sit for generations, and my children will tell the tale. If you're our guest here this morning, we want you to know that this table is set for all, and all are welcome to take of the bread, to drink of the cup. We believe that this table reflects God's love for all of humanity, and indeed all creation. So to keep somebody away from this space would be wrong. We do it by taking the bread when it is handed to you and eating it and then hold the cup until the end as we will drink the cup together. We do this because on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, gave thanks for it, handed it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is being broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out to his disciples saying this is my blood the cup of the covenant that God has made between God and all creation take and drink in remembrance of me for as often as you take of the bread or you drink of this cup you proclaim our Lord's death until his return It is in gratitude that we come around this table, grateful that we have this church to worship in, grateful for this time of communion. When we think back on what all you have created, God, this universe, the life we have, the way that a sun was set as an example for us to live by, as we take this bread, emblematic of how Jesus shed his life for all of us, may we be willing to give of ourselves to help the injustices and hardships that we find in our world. O oh God, O oh God of love, help our fears to cease and our courage to light the world. For it is in his name that we take this bread. Gracious God, we come humbly to this table, remembering Jesus' gift of himself for all the world and drawing us together in one in these simple gifts of bread and wine. In Jesus' name, and in the presence of his Spirit, eternally, we pray. Amen.
take, drink the cup of our salvation. Our worship is so much more than the songs that we sing. It's the way that our lives reflect the gratitude that we have for God, God's creation, and all of the good things that we've been given. Don't get me wrong. The things that we do in church, the order, the ways that we sing are important. If we sang the hymns in the hymnal to the tune of Alvin and the Chipmunks, it might be kind of funny, but probably not very edifying. The point is this. So long as the songs that we sing or the prayers that we pray in church are but the notes that harmonize with the melody that sustains the mission, which is care and service for what Jesus, who Jesus called the least of these, well, then God will hear every note that we send up in hopes that he will hear. Go with God and have a wonderful week. Amen.